This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, this is Joetta McLean, Nikki in George Romero's Season of the Witch. And you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Tommy is such a sweetie. I was so thrilled to be on his podcast. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past. The only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now, I am so friggin' excited for today's show because it's been a long, long time coming. I will be talking to the beautiful, delicate scream queen of the 70s, Lynn Lowry. Yes, Lynn Lowry, who's been in so many cult classics of 70s horror, such as I Drink Your Blood, George A. Romero's The Crazies. Um, she was also in David Cronenberg's Shivers, she was in, um, Cat People, she played the prostitute in that, and she's done a lot of non-horror films like Fighting Mad, Jonathan Demme's movie with Peter Fonda, and, uh, she was also in Lloyd Kaufman's first, uh, couple of movies, as a matter of fact, The Battle of Lovers Return and Sugar Cookies, and it's going to be a great conversation today. She she left um, on camera acting for a lot of years and then came back. And uh, she's been riding a wave. She's been um, in a lot of films in the last decade or so. And it's going to be a great conversation. Like I said, hot August summer has just started. And summer overall is winding down. And I'm having such great interviews. I'm so blessed beyond belief. So yeah, here is my interview with the beautiful Lynn Lowry. Hello. Hey Lynn, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm just fine. How are you doing? I am pretty good. I'm pretty good. I'm so excited. I cannot tell you what an honor this is uh, to me. You're one of the absolute best scream queens of classic horror, and I appreciate you taking the time today. Oh, thank you. It's my pleasure. Awesome. So, going back in time, I was reading uh, your father was a jazz trumpet player. Uh, did you have any interest in music before going into acting? Yes, actually, I started playing the trumpet when I was five years old. Wow. I was in the band all during grade school, and I uh, played in a lot of contests and won a lot of first superior medals, and all the way into high school, I was in the concert band and the marching band, and then at some point in high school, I switched to the French horn. But yeah, I played an instrument from the time I was five years old until... Uh, till I was like 17. Wow, so you were like a prodigy. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that, but uh, I was pretty good. Mhm. Mm did you, did your father know all the you know. um did he know all the jazz greats like Duke Ellington and Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis and all of them? Oh yeah, he uh <clears throat> he was a big fan of Chet Baker and um, all of those, you know, those great trumpet players and jazz people. So I kind of grew grew up with that. And he played with a lot of people in St. Louis. We, we lived there before we moved to California and then to Georgia. So, yeah, I was around music from a very young age. Wow, that is just amazing. You were born in Chicago, right? No, I was born in East St. Louis, Illinois. Oh, okay. Well, close to it. It's Illinois. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, um, in, not, in maybe the last, like, maybe 10 years ago, uh, for about 10 years, I had my own jazz trio in California, and I played at a lot of clubs there. Uh, not the trumpet, just singing, but, uh, but I did have a, a trio, and... I would come home every Christmas, and my dad and I would do a show together here, you know, a big show, and he'd invite everyone, and it was a lot of fun. It was a great way to bond with him. Oh, uh, did you start singing early on, too? No, 
I didn't start singing until I think I was in my 40s. And um, my dad really wanted me to go out with him and just be able to sit in and sing while he played. And so I started taking lessons at that point and going to piano bars and, you know, singing every chance I got. And, you know, so it was a lot of fun and definitely a, a great learning experience for me because I, I'm not really a spontaneous performer. I really like rehearsal and I really like to know what I'm doing. But right. when you're singing in a show, you don't really know what the audience is going to do or how they're going to react. So you have to to learn, you know, how to be really spontaneous and improvisational. So that really helped me a lot also in my acting from doing that with the singing audiences. Right. So you started um, acting um, when you were 17 at the Shawnee East Summerstock Theater? Well, that was my first professional job, but I did, of course, a lot of plays and things like that in high school and grade school. Uh, but professionally, that was the first time that I ever got paid was at the Shawnee Summer Theater in Bloomfield, Indiana. Wow. Did you do music? My second, my second season. What? Go ahead. I was going to ask you if you had done musical theater. No. Um, Never did that. Uh, never, just never really thought about singing until much, much later in my life. Right. But the interesting thing, I, I worked at the Shawnee Summer Theater for two years, and the second year I was there, John Belushi was there in the company. <laughs> so I got to do, uh, I think, three plays with him. Mm -hmm. So that was that was pretty pretty interesting. He was sixteen and I was seventeen. Yeah. So, yeah. Did he, did he, was he cracking everybody up all day? No, he was pretty um, much of a loner. Um, he had a tent that he slept in, and he had a motorcycle, and <laughs> uh, he was, you know, smoking marijuana at the time, and, um, you know, he wasn't all that funny. So, <laughs> but, you know, he was very talented even then, and... He, play, he played Cardinal Woolsey in Anne of a Thousand Days, and then he was the the villain in Ten Little Indians that I was in with him, and he had to try to kill me at the end of the play. So he had his hands around my neck choking me. <laughs> <laughs> my, my John Belushi story. And, and my... my my boyfriend, who you think is dead in the play, isn't dead, so he's supposed to shoot him to stop him from choking me, mm -hmm. and he, the gun wouldn't go off. So John, who is pretty much method method actor, he just keeps on, like, choking me, and finally my boyfriend, like, you know, pretends to hit him in the head with something to, like, knock him out so he would stop, you know, killing me. So it was, it was pretty funny. Yeah, that is pretty funny. For some reason, I can picture him um, uh, sleeping in a tent. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was pretty much of a rebel, for sure. That, that must have been just amazing, though, doing professional theater that young. I mean, did you get to travel a lot? No, I, I was in college um, at the University of Georgia, and uh, for two summers I went just to that theater but it was a i mean we did everything i mean you know you clean the toilets you mm -hmm. you know you did props on one of the shows you know you built the scenery you know you acted in the plays you know you clean the dorms i mean it was a you know definitely a well-rounded experience in the theater for, for sure you'd be rehearsing one play in the morning and performing another play that night so it was uh, it was pretty intense. Mm -hmm. And then um, you worked at the Playboy Club in Atlanta. Yes, I did. <laughs> How was that experience? Uh, it wasn't a very good experience for me. Um, I'm not much at... <sighs> Let me see how I can put this. The girls that worked at the Playboy Club were very enthusiastic about being a bunny. Right. And 
they they loved going on the promotions and they loved putting their costumes on and they loved having beautiful fi- fingernails and brushing their tails. I know that sounds weird, but you were supposed to brush your tail and you put your uniform on and everything. Mm-hmm. And I just wasn't into that at all. I was not a very good bunny. Uh, also, too, I, I didn't have very big kids at that time. So uh, some people actually would request another bunny when they would come because my tits weren't that big. And um, so they eventually they put me in the, um, the bumper pool room where I played bumper pool with the men. Mm-hmm. And when you, you know, you bend over the table, you look like you've got bigger, bigger tits. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't, a, I would not say I was a very good bunny, but I did try. Yeah. I just hated, you know, you had to wear, they were only three inch heels at that time, but they were so uncomfortable. And the, the costume that r- rides way far up on your hip was pressing on a nerve and causing my whole left buttocks to be completely numb. Oh. It was a very uncomfortable, so... Yeah, I, I talked Never to... Never met you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I talked to Catherine Lee Scott from Dark Shadows. She was a bunny at, I believe, the Chicago Club, and she was there with Deborah Harry um, in the mid-60s. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, times have changed and everything, but back then it was such a, you know, free-spirited time in the sexual revolution, and uh, things were, uh-huh. were, you know, being done without consequence. And stuff. Did you did you uh, get to know or meet uh, Hugh Hefner? No, I, I never never met him. Yeah, I've talked. Never to, got to go to the mansion or anything. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of bunnies and playmates who never got to meet him, and I just I, mm. I, I just think it's so it's so funny because you know back in L.A. at his mansion, I mean everybody knew him, you know. But um, right, yeah. But uh, I do own a copy. That's of... Uh, in Playboy, though. What was that? I, I have a I have a picture in Playboy. I know I own a copy of it. Was it was a poem. Yeah. Yeah, called Monday's Child, and I was Wednesday. So it's it's a beautiful picture, and mm-hmm. actually the the artist Rosamond took that picture, and she uh, she made some changes to it and she brought it out as a lithograph and she made a great deal of money on that photograph and um, and a lot of her other works after that were based on that original picture that she she took from Playboy nice nice so did you make your way to New York to study acting yes I did I got married uh, when I was 19 and I had my son and then I took my two-year-old son to New York to pursue my acting career. I wanted to study acting there and of course be, you know, a Broadway actress and, you know, yeah. so that was, that was a great experience. And sometimes I think back on it. I mean, I literally, I, I had $40 and my son and an airplane ticket and my husband was going to join us later and he had some friends there and I was staying with them and I had to try to get a job and um, it was pretty difficult with a with a little you know two-year-old kid with you but we managed we made it oh god bless you yeah I could imagine at that point in time it <laughs> it could be pretty hectic um did you go to the H- HB studios no, I I actually studied with Alan Miller, um, who was was on um, he was on Knots Landing for a long time, and mm-hmm. he was also on a soap opera that I was on for about a year and a half called How to Survive a Marriage. <laughs> and then after I studied with Alan, I studied with Warren Robertson for about five years. I was with Warren. And um, and then also Lester Shang, who is just one of my best friends in all the world, and oh. I worked with him a lot and did a lot of theater in New York. Never got to be on Broadway, but I did off Broadway. So, you oh. know, I got close. 
Oh, that's great. But it great. was a great experience. I loved New York. Yeah. Did, did any of your classmates go on to become successful in acting? Well, um, James Earl Jones was in my acting class. Oh. <laughs> Diane, the, Diane Keaton was in my acting class. Mm-hmm. Um, let me see. Who else? Oh, Betty Buckley. Oh, yeah. Who, you know, was a Broadway, a lot of Broadway and, and film work as well. Carrie. So, yeah, there were... There were quite a few people that uh, that were in my acting class that I got to work with. That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, it was a, a much more, it was a smaller community back then. There was no internet. Everybody knew each other. Yeah. Yeah, It's in a way, it was really nice that we didn't have internet. But in another way, it wasn't because you couldn't really network as well you know you you couldn't contact people and i mean i get a lot of work from all of my contacts on facebook now and back then it was like you just you had to like walk the pavement and go door to door and take your picture and hope that you know maybe somebody would see you or an agent would you know agree to meet with you or you know, things like that. You, you, a paper came out every week called Backstage, and I would get that. And that's how I got uh, I Drink Your Blood and also The Crazies from that paper. So wow. it was real, real different back then. Yeah. Oh, but so you got um, I Drink Your Blood through Backstage. Wow. Um, is it true that your character uh, originally wasn't in the script? Oh, yeah. No, David had already um, cast the movie when I showed up at the auditions, and he was packing up and getting ready to leave. And I, I walked in, and he was just, you know, he just loved me immediately. He just thought I was just, you know, so pretty. And, you know, he said, you know, I want you in my movie. I must have you in my movie, you know. And he said, "Let me think about let me think about what I can do because everything's cast, and I'll call I'll call you in like a couple of days." And I never thought I would hear hear from David really, but in like you know two days he called me and he said, "I've decided to make you a mute in the movie, and that way I don't have to write any more lines." So that's you know how I got the part, and that's why I'm not credited in the film either because my character was never in the script it was never in the cast breakdown so when the people got the movie to edit it and put it together mm -hmm. i'm not there so i didn't get any credit for it but of course everyone knows i'm in it so it doesn't really matter okay i was going to ask you if uh, you weren't a member of sag yet or, or that or if that was why um oh, oh was i gonna say was this no, your... i wasn't a member of sag yet Oh, okay. Was this your? That wasn't why. Was this your first movie audition? Um, no, I mean I had gone on quite a few, and I had worked with Lloyd Kaufman at that yeah. point. I had um, the Battle of Love's Return was started out to be a short film, and so I, I met Lloyd. I was at an audition for uh, Can and Joe that Peter Boyle was. And I, I think John Avelson was the director. And Lloyd was a PA or, or something on the film. And he, he came to work that day, but I happened to be in the waiting room getting ready for my audition. And he saw me and he rushed over and he said, you know, oh my God, I, we just lost our, the girl that's playing the dream girl in my movie. And you would be perfect, you know, would you do it? And so uh, that's how I met Lloyd. And then I and then I did I Drink Your Blood, which was my first feature film. And then Lloyd decided to make uh, Battle of Love's Return a feature, so he turned it into a feature. But my first movie was I Drink Your Blood, feature. Mm -hmm. What was it like working with Liz Marner Brooks on I Drink Your Blood? She's great. I mean, we're friends now. I've seen her. She came to, I, I got us a reunion at Cinema Wasteland in 2019. Um, she and Rhonda Fultz and Ty Kearney, we all mm -hmm. went there. And, you know, we, we also did uh, the Phoenix, Phoenix Fear Pond, 
Um, and you know, Elizabeth, she's wonderful. She's a she's a teacher in New York, and right. she's still beautiful and funny and smart. And you know, I didn't really. I mean, I had no scenes with Elizabeth during the movie, so I didn't get to know her as well as I did, you know, Rhonda. Because Rhonda and I had lots of scenes together. Right. But, but she was very nice. I talked to Liz a couple of years ago. Yeah, she's a great lady. Um, I told her this, and she and she agreed with me. Um, after George Romero did Night of the Living Dead, you know, he it, it, it kind of it reinvented the horror genre, but also killed it for a few years because um, people were having a hard time coming up with something original. It seemed like you know, it seemed like everyone was making a horror movie based on the Manson family killings. Whether it was this or Blood Sabbath, a couple other movies that came out at that time. And then The Exorcist and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they reinvented it, the their, their sub-genres of horror and made the, the genre better, you know. I mean, would you agree that was the case with this? That it was, um, you know, a Manson Family-inspired horror film? Well, you know, I don't... David's never said to me that he was inspired by that film to make I Drink Your Blood. <laughs> he told mm -hmm. me that he took acid one night and he wrote it. So yeah. I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it does seem like it was, you know, influenced by it and maybe subconsciously it was influenced by it, but I don't think he consciously tried to base it on Night of the Living Dead. Right. He was just trying to um, go with, you know, what was going on in the in the, uh, the young teenage, you know, culture at the time. Right, right. Yeah. So going back to Lloyd, though, on the battle of um, Love's Return and stuff, uh, you know, I, I've, seen, I've seen and heard many interviews Lloyd has done. You know, he's just wonderfully eccentric and funny has he is he still like that do you ever run into him at conventions has he always been that way um yes i mean i think more so now than when i worked with him in the 70s mm -hmm. he was a little bit more of a serious artist i think at that point um but you know he was still very funny and uh, you know very intelligent and i have uh, Done. I, I did an interview for him for Sugar Cookies when it came out on DVD, right. and he had the Toxic Avenger guy dancing around behind me, and <laughs> you know everything. It was just so bizarre. Yeah. But and he was, you know, he was just you know crazy in the interview. But then when he walked me out to my car, he was. He was not, I know, he was just really nice and wonderful. So that's just, you know, his persona, his public persona is that he's like that, um, you know. And right. and he just loves the fans and he just loves to to perform. And he's really just a great, great person. And his wife also is very nice. Right. And, of course, Oliver Stone was in the movie. Everyone knows that the two of them were buddies. I think they went to NYU together. Right. Yeah. I think Oliver denies being in the movie, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he is in it. Because we had a scene together where we're all pretending to smoke grass, and he's in that scene, and so, you know. But, you, yeah. You pretended you didn't really yeah, do I don't it. Yeah, see. No, we weren't. Oh. I, I think we had, like, cigarettes that were rolled or something that looked like it. But, no, they wasn't wasn't really grass. I don't understand why people deny, you know, being in something. I think that, I think you should just appreciate everything that you did, you know, for the, for the in the time that you did it. Because you wanted to do it at that moment, and just because it didn't turn out, you know, to be a great film or whatever, you know, I think that that's kind of cowardly to, to do that. 
I so agree. I mean, I've, I've talked to, you know, over 1,200 plus people and on this podcast, and I've had maybe just a handful of people who said, I don't want to talk about that one movie or something. And luckily, it's been a movie that I, I didn't even care about. But for the most part, yeah, I've, I mean, I've talked to people who, who, uh, who own, you know, their past as far as uh, movie making. But whenever I do hear that, yeah, I just like, you know, you can't deny that it didn't happen, you know. I mean, I'm sure stuff happened behind right. the scenes. And you don't have to talk about what happened behind the scenes. But come on, just own it, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I know. I know. Yeah. So with um, Sugar Cookies, I mean, that was that was a, an X-rated movie. I mean, were you comfortable doing that one? Well, I turned I turned the movie down at first because I didn't want to do that much nudity. Um, but Lloyd kept talking to me about it, and he they agreed that they wouldn't show any frontal, uh, not not breasts. They showed breasts, obviously, but any lower frontal nudity. nudity. And so once they agreed to do that. Uh, then I then I said I would do it because I because it was so much camera time and I got to play two different people and I just thought you know it would be you know something that would be a great experience for me to have as an actress and it I mean it was uncomfortable in the beginning you know to take all your clothes off in front of everyone mm -hmm. but seriously once you're like nude for like. 30 minutes nobody nobody cares anymore I mean they just treat you like a prop you know they just want you to be in the right light they just step over you if you're on the floor you know they throw a robe over you if they don't want you to get up you know so I, I got over pretty quickly you know feeling uncomfortable about it um, and there's really not any really x-rated stuff in that movie I mean you know, Mary and I have beautiful scenes together, but, you know, all we basically do is kiss and mm -hmm. you don't really see anything, you know. So I don't know why it was rated X. Now, I know why Score was rated X, but um, but Sugar Cookies, no. And Lloyd always said it's the only X-rated film ever that didn't make money. And, <laughs> and, and that's because they advertised it as this, like, lesbian movie and it's not a lesbian movie it's mm -hmm. not about uh, i mean mary was probably playing a lesbian in the film but my character is not and she just falls in love you know with the mary's character and so it's you know i i think they advertised it in, in the wrong way and that's why it never did very well but it's a beautiful film and honestly i think it's the most beautiful film that lloyd ever made Right, because it's so out of left field for him, you know, with all this crazy politically incorrect stuff that he's known for. Right, right. Were you were you comfortable kissing the the girl though? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, you mean Mary? Yeah. Warnoff. Uh, Mary Warnoff, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, she's beautiful, and yeah. uh, you know, that was just my character. That was what I had to do as an actress. So. You know, you just act. You know, you act like you like kissing the person, or you know, you're in love with the person. It's just part of your acting ability. Right. It wasn't distasteful. I mean, no. She's like, you know, like I said, she's beautiful. I've talked to a lot of people who have worked with her, and they they tell me that uh, she's usually intimidating. What was she not intimidating on this movie? No, I mean, you know, I think that people think that about Mary because she's so tall mm -hmm. and strong looking and she doesn't put up with any bullshit. I mean, she's like totally right, you know, direct, Right. but she's sweet. I mean, she's a very, you know, giving actress and um, I didn't, you know, I had no problem with her and I've seen her. A few times uh, in the past, you know, 10, 15 years, we've had dinner a couple of times together. She's a fabulous artist. Right. She's an incredible painter. So, I mean, I really enjoyed seeing her work when I went to her house and saw her work. Just wow. Amazing. Yeah. 
So the crazies um, was also a backstage um, one you got. Um, were, were you aware of the impact that uh, George Romero had made with Night of the Living Dead? Because he was coming off of it at the time. <laughs> Not really. I'd never seen the movie. Um, wow. I didn't know who George was. Uh, I mean, it, if, I think it came out in 68. Yeah. And I just... I wasn't particularly into zombie movies, so I never saw it. And, um, I mean, I didn't see it for uh, actually a number of years after I even did The Crazies. And, and, I mean, I've seen it now several times, and I think it's brilliant. Yeah. But, but at that particular time, you know, I didn't know really who George was. or You know, it was just, you know, a, another opportunity to act and to go to Pittsburgh and, you know, yeah. <laughs> work with him. What did you think he of the script? He was great to work with. Yeah. What, what did you think of the script? Uh, of what? What, what? what did you think of the script for The Crazies? Uh, I thought it was very good. I mean, I, um, I think it definitely holds up. I mean, I've seen it several times recently, and it's it's very disturbing. And uh, I I think Lane Carroll and uh, Will McMillan, I think they were wonderful in it. And of course, uh, Richard Liberty, who played my father, uh, I, I and uh, also the um, the other actor, how, I can't think of his Harold, right? Harold Jones, right? right. Uh, I thought all of, all of us the core of us trying to escape were very, very good. So, yeah, it's it's a great film. And gosh, at the end when Lane is hidden behind those bricks and stuff and she's, you know, crying and, oh, it's, it's very disturbing. And it will be, it, it will, people ask me sometimes the difference between that movie and the remake, which I got to do a little cameo in. Mm -hmm. And it's just that in, in another 45 years, people are still going to be watching Romero's The Crazies. Yeah. But they're not going to remember the remake. No. You know, the remake is good. It's, it's fun. It's entertaining. But it just doesn't have that impact that, you know, that George's film has. Oh, yeah. I mean, all the remakes of his movies were fun, but they didn't have that impact. No. He, right. his, his movies were one of a kind. You know, I, I talked to uh, Bonnie Heinzman, and she told me that there was an issue uh, with the city of Evan City involving the railroad scene. And um, I, she had told me that because I had asked that, that um, there was a, an anecdote that... Um, um, what's his name who plays Colonel Peckham? He was naked when he was naked um, near the end of the movie. Uh, the city of Evans City was offended by that to the point where George had to hire a lawyer. Did you ever hear that story? No, I've never heard that. Um, wow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I met Bonnie. Well, actually, I was. It's funny, you know, Bonnie and Bill. Uh, Bill and Bonnie, Bonnie was working, on, you know, on the film, and of course, you know, Bill was a cinematographer, right? And um, they weren't together, but but they seemed like they should should have been. And I remember riding with them in the car somewhere, and I remember saying, you know, you guys have so much in common, you know, you know, you should. <laughs> you know, you should get together or something like that. And then they ended up getting married and everything. So, I don't know. I just kind of always thought maybe I inspired them to get together. But. Bonnie highly praised you, too. She said that you were wonderful to her on the movie. Oh, she's so sweet. I met, we were at the, the uh, Living Dead uh, convention a couple of years ago in Evan City, and she was there, and Lane was supposed to come. Lane had never done a convention, ever. Mm -hmm. And I had talked to her for years to try to talk her into it. And she finally, finally decided that she was going to do it. And then she passed away two weeks before the show. Oh. So it was a very sad, sad show. And, uh, you know, but Bonnie was there, and I was there, and... You know, but it was sad. Yeah, I can imagine. 
Do you ever see Richard France? Um, Richard was at that show, so I, you know, met him. I, I didn't really work with Richard, you know, on the film because he was always in the soldier scenes and stuff like that, and I don't think I had any scenes with him. Um, so, but, but he was at that convention. He sat right next to me, so we got to talk a bit. Yeah, I hope I get to talk to him. I, he's kind of an anomaly, you know. He's got a, um, I know he's got a, a Facebook fan page, and um, I sent him a message a couple of years ago. It was read, but I never got a response back. Hopefully, I'll get to talk to him at some point. But uh, then you got to work with uh, David Cronenberg on Shivers. How did that come to you? Um. Well, I think that uh, David and Ivan Reitman had seen me in the crazies, and um, they just, they, you know, thought I would be right for that role. So Ivan actually came to New York, and I met, had lunch with him, and they cast me in the part. I, I, I think I don't, I think that's how they found me was through the crazies. I'm not sure if they contacted Lee Hessel. I know that's how Bradley Metzger found me. Because he and Lee Hessel, who produced The Crazies, were good friends, and and Lee recommended me for score, so that's how I got that. But um, yeah, I just remember having lunch and them casting me, and them being upset with me because I refused to be completely nude in the scene where I uh, change out of my nurse's uniform into right. my regular clothes. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not going to take my underwear off to change, you know, out of the nurse's uniform. It's just, she wouldn't do that. So they they weren't too happy about that, but they finally agreed that, you know, the tits were enough. So <laughs> that was it. So. I heard you say in the previous interview that you're the proudest of uh, that movie, of all the stuff you did in the 70s. Is that true? Um, I love the pool scene, the best of any thing I've ever seen of me in any film. Mm -hmm. um, that that moment where I turn in the pool is just, a, it's a breathtaking moment, and I love it. So uh, I would say probably in the 70s, well, I mean... The Crazies comes close to, you know, being a, my favorite film to do, but I, I guess Shiv Shivers was probably, you know, my absolute favorite. Yeah, I heard that. It was great to work with. Yeah, I heard that. With Cronenberg and everything. Yeah, I heard he's like an insurance salesman, but yet he creates these, you know, gruesome, horrific images on screen. You know, he's like the complete polar opposite of what he puts on screen. Yes, I mean, he was then. I, I have not seen him since then. I think I ran into him once at Cannes Film Festival. But, um, yeah, he was just a very, um, you know, kind of studious, you know, <laughs> just, a, just a regular guy. It's, it's amazing, you know, what he came up with, you know, in his career. I mean, he talk about pushing the envelope and of course Shivers is the, the first film to ever have body horror in it so I mean it was a big big deal you know, he was, and he was great to work with yeah I mean he brought uh, body horror to you know um, the world you know I can't even think of any body horror before him how was working with Ivan Reitman uh, Ivan uh -huh. um, he, you know he was okay I mean he he was just sort of on the peripheral of the actual making of the movie, and um, you know, he was he was fine. I mean, I didn't get to know him very well, and we had a bit of an argument when I first arrived there because he, my agent, had not negotiated a per diem for me for food and stuff, and Ivan was telling me that he wasn't they weren't going to give me any per diem and I told him I was going to get back on the plane and go back to New York if they weren't yeah and so we kind of hit it off wrong but he they gave me the per diem so it all you know worked out and um, you know but I didn't get to know him too well 
I was working with Barbara Steele. Oh, well, I the only time I ever was with Barbara on the set was in the pool scene. And we were just, we were waiting to go into the pool. And it was pretty cold, and so... Barbara and I were drinking brandy and just covered in blankets to try to stay warm. And so we just, you know, chatted and had some girl talk and stuff like that. And she was delightful. And I've done a convention with her a couple of times since then. And, you know, we've reminisced about it, but unfortunately didn't really get to act with her. Mm -hmm. Then you uh, got to work with Jonathan Demme on Fighting Mad. This was during his Roger Corman right. era, what was he like? He was great. I mean, I just so wish that I could have worked with him again. I was actually supposed to be in The Last Embrace, and mm -hmm. then they, Roy Scheider decided that he wanted his girlfriend to uh, play the role that, that Jonathan had asked me to do, so I didn't get to do it. Um, but yeah, he actually, Jonathan had seen me in score and he just loved my look and he just really wanted me to, you know, to do the film. And I had to fly out to California and buy my own ticket um, to, to go meet Roger Corman. And so it was just, it was kind of a risk because Jonathan couldn't just cast me. Roger had to have the final say. So I bought my own ticket and flew out there and, I met Roger, and you know, they, he liked me and cast me, and it was a great experience working with Peter, of course, yeah. and um, John Doucette, oh, and Scott Glenn, and Noble Willingham. Really good cast. Yeah, the great cast. What? Oh, uh, I mentioned Noble Willingham. He was in the the movie too. Right. Did, were, were you surprised when um, Demi became Oscar-winning Jonathan Demi? Um, no, because, I mean, I had seen, you know, his career and the things that he was doing. And um, I don't know if he had made Philadelphia before Silence of the Lambs, but it was brilliant, you know. It, mm -hmm. His films were... So, no, I wasn't surprised. I mean, he really seemed to know what he was doing and what he wanted to do. And and the interesting thing about his work is even in Fighting Mad, you know, he had a lot of those sort of family scenes and real earthy, you know, people playing certain roles. That, you know, they weren't actors. And he seemed to carry that uh, sense through a lot of the movies that he made, even as he got, you know, bigger and bigger and more successful. And I think that that um, being grounded that way and showing, you know, people in such a real way really helped, you know, make his career so successful. Yeah, and his, and his, and his uh, nephew Ted was a good filmmaker too. He passed way too soon as well. Yeah, I know. I was shocked when, you know, I heard that Jonathan had passed away. I guess he'd been sick for quite a while, though. Yeah, but he left behind a, a great body of work. He did a lot of good stuff. Oh, yes. Yeah. You got to play a prostitute in uh, Cat People. Uh, how was doing that? Um, you know, I'm really, really happy I'm in the movie, and I think it's a great scene. And I think that um, I have actually made more money from that movie and residuals and stuff than any <laughs> film I ever did. But actually doing the movie was very traumatic and very difficult working with Paul Schrader. Right. And um, I got hurt. And, you know, the, they just didn't seem to care that, you know, I was getting hurt. So, you know... I had to fall down the stairs like over 20 times because they couldn't get the shot and stuff like that. They tried to they tried to not pay me for the stunt work, which somebody told me that I should be getting paid for the stunt work as well as the acting work. So I had to, you know, I had to clear that up. And it just, uh, just 
wasn't it wasn't very much fun working with Paul Schrader. Yeah. He's not very um he didn't communicate very well and he, you know, talked really fast and, and gave you directions really fast and you know, he was hard to follow. So was not my favorite experience, but as I said, I'm very glad I'm in the movie because it's a memorable scene for sure. It's really frightening. It is. It's very creepy. And you were one of the most even-tempered prostitutes I have ever seen in my life because normally when you see a prostitute on film, she's got kind of a Brooklyn attitude. You know, she's just doing it for strictly business. She's got a gun hidden somewhere. But no, you were just very empathetic. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So what made you take a long break from acting on film? I couldn't, get, I couldn't get any work, and um, I was out in California, and I had done, I don't know, a couple of TV movies, I think, and, um, you know, at that time, I didn't realize that I had a fan base. I didn't realize that so many people had seen these movies that I did in the 70s. Right. And so when I was in California in the 80s, you know, the people in California could have cared less about you being in a George Romero film. Right. Uh, They just wanted to know what your last TV show was that you did. So I never even could even tell anybody on auditions or anything that I did those movies. And it never occurred to me that there was this whole incredible, you know, um, horror movie field that I could have, you know, been in and probably been working during those 10 years that I, you know, kind of gave up. But I did. I just gave up. I got tired of Hollywood and not getting work and going up for television things where they would have like 150 people reading for your part and then they'd be all different types. And I just thought, you know, fuck this. I just don't want to do this anymore. (laughs) So I just I just dropped out of the film business and I uh, concentrated on my theater acting and then the music and all that and that's what I did from like 1994 to about 2004. Right, and, and you. Then in 2004, go mm, ahead. Uh, I, I lost my train of thought. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, in two in 2004. Uh, I Drink Your Blood and the Crazies came out on DVD and I did, you know, interviews for them. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I was like back and I was like, wow, you know, and I, I remember looking myself up on uh, the, the internet one day. I, I wanted to see if there was anything on me and I typed my name in and there was like 30 pages of stuff, of all the stuff I had done. And I was like, holy shit. I mean, I just couldn't believe you know, that I had this whole legacy and all these fans and I was just floored. And so, you know, and then I started getting offers and going to conventions and, you know, just everything. And so I got like a second, a second chance, you know, to come back and do what I love to do. Yeah. You, you've caught up with a vengeance. I mean, God, you've done just a lot in the last, you know, 10 years or so. Um, it's been amazing. Yes. Anything uh, like you want to mention of, of note that you want that uh, you've done that you're proud of? Well, I'm especially proud of Model Hunger, which Debbie Rashawn directed. I love her. And I won some awards for that. Yeah, it's a it's a very very uh, intense film, and uh, I star in it. You know, and uh, my character is uh, she's she's really interesting. She's a southern southern belle, schizophrenic, um, you know, just insane, but charming, sexy, funny, and also a cannibal. <laughs> <laughs> All these different things, you know, and. So it was so much fun, you know, to do that role. And and I also, um, uh, three short films I'm very proud of, The Peripheral, 
a divination, both directed by J.T. Seaton and um, Ripper Tour and Ready for My Close-Up, which I shot in England, um, were two of my favorite short films. And then I did a film last January before the pandemic hit called Fang. Mm-hmm. And I play a woman who's in fifth, fifth stage Parkinson's and she's driving her son absolutely mad to the point where he literally thinks he's turning into a rat. <laughs> so it's, um, it's a very interesting film. Richard Bergen uh, wrote it and directed it, uh, and he's autistic. So that was a, you know, a fascinating uh, experience. Of course. Work, you know, to work with him and you know, bring that to life. So that hasn't come out yet. They're still working on it, but I'm really excited to see that. And I mean, just this year I did He Knows with Steve Morris, and I just did Guns of Eden with Gregory Lambertson last, last week in Buffalo. Nice. So, I mean, just so many, you know, films, you know. Very exciting. Chris Alexander I worked with, you know, in Toronto, and wow. I could go on and on and on about all the people I've worked with in the last 10 years. Um, well, well, you've worked with so my... I'm, and I'm just so excited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you've worked with my friend uh, Deborah Lamb. Oh, yes, yes, Deborah, she's great. I love Deborah. Oh, yeah. We did um, Espresso to Die For in uh, England. Um, and it's, I think, Michael Haberfelder, who's an f- incredible writer, uh, he's still editing it and trying to put it together. But it was, it was a very funny script. He also wrote Ready for My Close-Up. You know, so, yeah. And Deborah was, he was great in Expresso to Die For. So we've stayed pretty good friends. Yeah, I know she's been on here four times. The first time she was on, she was like one of my earliest guests. I can't believe how patient she was with me. I was a terrible, terrible, nervous wreck when I interviewed her the first time. And then the second time, I was more confident. And that that interview got a lot of play because we spent 80 minutes talking about masturbation and foot fetishism. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I could see how that might get a lot of play. Yeah, well, De- Deborah's yeah, has, Deborah's very sexy. Yeah, she's hysterically funny too. A very sexy, beautiful woman, and funny. Yeah, I know. Yeah, very funny. Are you uh, almost finished with your memoir? Um, no, I'm working on it. Uh, you know, it just I keep getting more work, and I just keep, you know, writing more and. I don't know when it's going to be finished, but, you know, hopefully hopefully one day it will be. Yeah, because uh, I know how it is. I started writing a book in January, and I've just been taking a break the last few months because I did a lot of crying during it, you know, and I've, I've, I'm already crying enough with uh, losing loved ones and, and people and stuff that, you know, i got to pick what i got to be sad about, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I know. There's so much sadness right now in the world and everything. And I'm supposed to, I'm going to Miami in a, like on Labor Day weekend to do a sinister con there. Oh, really? Um, which I hope is, you know. Yeah, uh, Michael Barrowman's going to be there, Ken Hodder. Oh. Lloyd, Lloyd's going to be there, Lloyd Kaufman. Nice. Um, Tiffany Shepard's. Felissa Rose. Oh. So, you know, a nice lineup. So I'm looking forward to, to doing that. Where's that going to be? And then in, um, in Miami. In, in Miami. First horror convention ever in Miami. Nice. So. Do, you have, do you have any California conventions lined up? No. No, I don't have anything in California right now. I'm going to Des Moines in October for Halloween Palooza, um, and I'm doing a special thing in uh, Omaha for I Drink Your Blood on mm-hmm. Halloween weekend. So, yeah. Well, if you do get booked in uh, California, I will surely uh, come and see you. Um, I I've 
come and see a lot of my guests, and it's 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 always a wonderful experience. Uh, occasionally, I'll get a guest who yeah. di- I'll get a guest who doesn't remember me at first, and I have to refresh their memory, <laughs> you know. But I always try to send them an email before uh, before I go meet them, so they they know that I'm coming, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that would be great. I'd love to meet you. So to so. So I just want to I just I just wanted to to say that um, I really really appreciate you know all the fans that mm-hmm. have followed me all these years and given me all this support that they've given me and I just did a a screening in Buffalo of Shivers mm-hmm. um, at the uh, Amherst Theater and it was sold out. And so many people, you know, bought my pictures and posters and had things for me to sign and uh, take pictures with me. And uh, it was just a a fabulous experience, you know, to to meet so many wonderful people that, you know, have stayed with me all these years. So I just always like to to thank, you know, everyone for, for that. I'm very fortunate and very lucky to have so many wonderful fans. Yeah, so that's wonderful, Lynn. So, really quickly, there's a secret silly game that I like to play with my guests. This is just pure fun. It's a series of silly slumber party questions, and how the game works is I ask you the question, you answer it, and then you ask me the exact same question, and I answer it, and you can comment on answers. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's it's fun. Lynn, are you ticklish? <laughs> Are you ticklish? Yes. What is your favorite part of the body? It could be anything. My eyes. You do have What's very What's your favorite part of the body? You do have very nice eyes, Lynn. Um my favorite part is Thank you. My favorite part is the belly button. Oh, okay. Yes. So an Audi or an any? I have an any. You have an innie? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I like, I have an innie too. Yes, you have the belly button of an angel, I have to say. <laughs> Sorry if that embarrasses you. No, no one's ever, no, 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 it doesn't. But no one's ever said that to me before. So that that is definitely something brand new that I've never heard. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Woohoo, I'm the first one. <laughs> um, what, you are. What color are your toenails painted? Um, they are painted red. What color are your toenails painted? They are light pink right now. I just painted them for the first time in two years, and it feels so good. Really? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, light pink is a nice color for summer. I like the yeah, I like I like to go, you know, bright colors usually, but I don't know, I thought bright pink would be a nice one. What would you say is yeah. your best personality trait? Um mm, gosh. Uh I don't know. My best personality trait, hmm, probably that I'm charming, maybe. I agree. What's your, what's your best personality trait? I have this uh, mixture of having empathy, but also having no filter. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, a lot of people tell me it's 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 a good one, you know, it's a good uh, combination to have. And then my uh, yes, it's always nice to, to feel, have emotions, and feel for people, but then also to be direct and honest. So, exact, yeah. exactly. And then my favorite question: Is there a stinky smell that just makes you gag? I guess shit. <laughs> Sometimes. 
That is the first time I've ever heard anyone say that. Shit. <laughs> Either farts or feet. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, stinky feet is, yeah, that's that's bad. Yeah. Anyone with stinky, kids. Stinky feet. Oh, and stinky farts. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone with kids can relate to that. I know. I've, I've told many people that. They say, yeah, I have kids. I can relate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. And now, finally, Lynn, I have a couple jokes for you. What do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? I don't know. A liar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, thank you. And then, um, you know the difference between a golf ball and a G-spot? A man rather spend 20 minutes looking for a golf ball. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can understand that. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Lynn, thank you so much yeah. for coming on today. I'm glad that we could finally make this happen. Yes, me too. I'm, I'm glad that you got to talk to someone who was in the crazies and, you know, that we got to do that, so... You yes. know. Well, I wish you the best and everything, and I really enjoyed your questions. A lot of them were really unique and and things that nobody's asked me before. So, oh, great, one, wonderful. So yeah, so I'll stay in touch, and um, I'll let you know. You know, if um, if um, you know if you're at a convention, you know, I'll I'll be there. Okay, sounds good. All right, you All take right. care of yourself. Yes, you have a great day and stay okay. safe. Okay, you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Lynn Lowry. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a very nice lady, huh? It was worth the wait. I'm glad that we got to talk today, and I am just so blessed. She is so funny. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past. Because the present sucks. Liar, dudes.